This particular lesson is pretty interesting because we start to talk about some of the technical things that uh, security professionals are faced with in day-to-day -day operations and businesses. This is the global, the legal, and regulatory issues that we're faced with um, and that we have to deal with, um, I wouldn't say on a daily basis, but on a regular basis. One example of fraud uh, is um, uh, something called a crypto locker ransomware. I actually ran into this situation, uh, not exactly this scenario, but very close uh, with one of my relatives. Uh, let's just say that they're not necessarily computer savvy, but I got a call literally about a week and a half ago. And uh, she says, hey, uh, I need your help. I said, okay, what's going on? Well, my computer is blah, 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 blah. And I said, okay, explain the story to me. She said, well, I got uh, this message that popped up on my screen that said uh, that my computer was infected with a bunch of viruses and that I was to call this phone number, uh, which was a phone number, quote, unquote, for Microsoft. Um, and this is not, I'm not making this story up just to make anecdotal uh, uh, discussion. This is actually really happened. And um, she called them, uh, and uh, they requested to get access to her computer. So they had her go to a website, which allowed remote control of her computer. Um, and uh, they got into her computer, and they scanned, quote-unquote, scanned her computer. Uh, she was watching the whole time. Uh, and um, ended up identifying... Uh, I had a re re recovery, uh, identified over 50 different viruses, uh, whatever it was, whatever they found. And then they said they would clean those viruses, but it would cost $10 a virus or something like that. It was a really strange conversation, um, but I completely believe it because this happens all the time. So I guess the, they said basically we'll clean everything off. It'll cost you $10 a virus. Here, as you can see on the screen, there's 50 viruses, so we need $500, right? Uh, and at that point, uh, she decided, well, no, I'm not going to do that. This doesn't sound right. Something sounds fishy. And so she said, you need to log off my computer. She didn't know just to turn off the computer at this point. You need to log off my computer. And so they did a couple more things, and, uh, and they logged off. And at that point, that's when she called me and said, hey, this happened, blah, blah, blah. And I said, well, let's do this. Why don't you install TeamViewer on your computer? I will log into your computer and see what I can do to fix it um, because you have a virus or malware. Um, and uh, so I'm walking her through on the process of how to install TeamViewer, and the computer's not responding, the windows are slow, so I said, well, let's just go ahead and reboot the computer. And so she rebooted the computer, and a screen pops up and says that her computer was locked and uh, that she needed to call them to get her computer unlocked. So what ended up happening is these folks uh, decided that since she wasn't going to pay them the money, that they would install, uh, they actually just uh, uh, locked up the, the Microsoft uh, credentials. Uh, I forget the specifics, but... Um, it was a pretty easy fix with the registry and all that. But uh, uh, basically, they took her computer hostage and said, you know, if you're not going to, we're going to get your money one way or another, right? That's what we call ransomware. Now, that's one example of ransomware where somebody is taking control of your computer or your files or whatnot. A more traditional uh, uh, form of ransomware is where I, I encrypt files using a, pub, a public key. Uh, Certificate. So I take a, a public certificate, I encrypt your data with that public certificate, and the only way that you can decrypt that data is by receiving the private certificate, um, which they basically hold for ransom. So ransomware targets a computer. Uh, typically it's Windows, although I've, I've heard of scenarios where it's, it's more than Windows, but uh, it's, uh, it's a virus, right? It gets propagated with... Uh, attachments, infected attachments or whatnot, or a botnet, and it encrypts all of the data on your machine with an RSA public key cryptography. 
uh, and then the private key is stored on your malware server. So the only way that you can de decrypt anything that was, de uh, that was encrypted with a public key is to use the corresponding private key to decrypt that information. Uh, and by the way, this is static encryption and decryption, so it's very difficult uh, to break that. We'll see that. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about all that on, on Wednesday when we get into uh, uh, domain number three. Okay, actually probably tomorrow when we get into domain number three. So uh, what you end up getting is a message on your screen that says, hey, we're, we're gonna, we'll, we'll let you decrypt your data, but you're gonna have to pay us. And, and by the way, when you pay us, we'll send you the private key. You can use that private key to decrypt your information. All right, and uh, that's, uh, this is what it looks like. Hey, your important files, uh, encryption produced on this computer, all your photos, your videos, your documents, uh, here's a complete list of all the files that we encrypted. And that list, by the way, is completely accurate because they want you to know what they have control over. Encryption was produced using a unique public key, RSA 2048. RSA is Rivas, Shamir, and Edelman. Those are the guys that came up with the uh, structure. Uh, and it's a 2048-bit key. Uh, to decrypt the files, you need to obtain the private key. Uh, there's only one copy of the private key. And by the way, if you pay us $300 uh, or 300 euros or some other value equivalent in currency, we'll send you the private key. Now, what's interesting about this is there's a time limit on this. So you have uh, 71 hours, 59 minutes, and 33 seconds left to comply. And what else is interesting about this is that they're actually totally legit. They actually encrypted your data. You have no control over that. There's no way to recover that data without the private key, unless you have a backup. Um, and if you pay them, they will most likely send you the private key because they don't want to get a reputation of not honoring their commitment because then people will simply not pay. So it's a pretty interesting concept. Uh, uh, we've seen customers affected by this and the recourse is simply to pay because they have, don't, don't have adequate backups of their data. They don't have, uh, uh, they can't recover their data otherwise. And the cost to mitigate the damage without paying the attacker is far out, uh, far outweighs the cost of simply paying the attacker. Um, so uh, very, very interesting concept. Another one is a child pornography scare. Um, this is uh, also a virus that gets spread through, through infected websites or files. Uh, it locks your computer and it displays a federal uh, warning, a uh, law violation. Depending on where you live, it will have the different federal agencies for that particular nation state or, or governing body. Uh, there's child pornography embedded in the message. Uh, uh, and then the, the whole point, again, is to uh, extort money from the individual. Um, now, the uh, interesting concept of this, so here's a picture of, of what that looks like. Uh, your computer has been locked. Uh, the illegal content, 414 megabytes of photos and videos were automatically classified as child pornography. All right. And then they cite all the different laws and regulations. They even give you pictures, thankfully they're blurred out here, uh, pictures of what's supposedly on your computer. Now that might not actually be on your computer or it might be, uh, although I haven't seen this before, uh, it might be um, uh, installed on your computer through the, through the use of a Trojan or a virus, but most likely it's not really there, um, but your computer screen is locked. Now it's interesting that the FBI, the Department of Justice, the NSA, they will take money grams, right? Uh, because that's how they solve criminal activity. They, they accept money grams, right? Um, it's, uh, but people actually uh, fall for this. They actually pay, um, and it's a, it's a scare tactic, right? Um, I haven't seen this one before. I've seen the ransomware. This could be effectively another form of ransomware uh, with a little bit of a different flavor or twist to it, but uh, it's, uh, uh, I like how they have the little, the little icons here 
give us your wallet and your credit card and we'll unlock your computer. So trying to make it as uh, easy as possible. So interesting concept. Uh, another uh, uh, type of ransomware is the Citadel ransomware. Uh, very, very similar to what we've already looked at. Uh, um, and uh, it's, you know, basically the same concept, right? Your computer is going to get locked. You're going to get some sort of a person, a message from your, your governing body or, you know, regulatory body, whether it be the police or the FBI or whatever. Uh, again, referring to copyrighted materials, child pornography, uh, and then uh, and what's interesting in this case is they might even go one step further. Here, they might actually activate the webcam attached to your computer. Uh, and all of a sudden, you're looking at this message and you're looking at your face on the screen. That can be disconcerting to grandma, right? Uh, obviously, uh, um, something that uh, is, uh, well, can, can really scare somebody, all right? Um, obviously, the way we protect against this, we make sure that we have all the uh, necessary technical controls in place to ensure that we don't get infected with this information in the first place, all right? Uh, this was the, the situation that I described, a uh, fake or rogue antivirus software. Uh, so you're either, you're either tricked into purchasing some sort of antivirus application or you're tricked into calling a number to give somebody access to your computer. Um, and you, uh, I'm sure you guys have heard of this one before. You get those pop-ups. The pop-ups uh, indicate a link where you can purchase software. And uh, by the way, uh, this is a virus right here, but uh, the um, fake or rogue antivirus software looks completely legitimate, right? Uh, oh, I've, I've, I've scanned these files and these are viruses on my computer. These are warnings. So you click clean my computer and then you get directed to a website to purchase software. Or it could be Potentially, and this is often the case where you're directed to a site where you can download a free quote unquote cleaning tool, but that quote unquote cleaning tool has a virus in itself or it's a Trojan uh, that allows uh, some command and control server to take control of your computer to participate in a botnet or something to that effect. So, uh, you know, when you're dealing with uh, the social aspect of security, these are the types of things that we as IT folks kind of always just assume aren't real. But the, to a layman, to a non-IT person, these can seem very real. Uh, and, it, and it happens all the time. Uh, I, countless times I've dealt with uh, individuals that are not necessarily technical. This looks very technical, it looks very legitimate. So they, they uh, try to comply with whatever is being stated on the screen or whatever. Cybercrime uh, makes up one third of all crime globally. I'll bet you that number is even higher today. Uh, significant part is child pornography and piracy. Uh, I would say piracy is probably the biggest part. Um, other acts of crime uh, would be trying to steal identities, uh, steal um, assets or individual um, intellectual property components or whatnot. So that would be a crime against confidentiality. Uh, integrity, possibly, uh, accessibility of computer systems. So this and this, I would say, are probably the most predominant cybercrime activities uh, with regard to stealing somebody's personal information or doing some sort of DDoS attack uh, for accessibility. Integrity, mm, not so much, right? Ma making sure that, or changing information in, in motion. Um, mostly it's uh, just trying to gain access to information or trying to prevent other people from getting access to that information. So as a security professional, 
you need to assess cybercrime by evaluating several different things. Number one, loss of intellectual property and sensitive data. If you suspect that your organization has been affected by cybercrime, this is the very first thing that you need to consider. What was actually stolen or modified or uh, isn't available anymore? Uh, the services and employment disruptions. How is that going to affect our operations based on what was stolen or what was compromised? The damage to our brand image and company reputation. This is your C-level guys. They're really going to be concerned about that uh, damage to brand and, and uh, a company reputation. But so as a network engineer or as an information assurance individual, uh, even though you might end up being the one fired because of the incident, ultimately it's the, the stakeholders, the shareholders, uh, and the CXOs that are going to be uh, concerned about that. What are the penalties resulting in financial loss? Uh, organizations can be fined for disclosing personal information or not acting with due, due diligence uh, or individuals acting with due care. So if there's some sort of negligence, there can be fines or otherwise other related uh, uh, components. The cost of countermeasures and insurance. So this would be... Uh, these two last two bullet points would be kind of a pre-condition uh, that we want to look at, right? We want to identify countermeasures that we can implement, insurance that we can buy, what's the cost of mitigation, et cetera, and a cost of recovery if data is lost. Uh, this is post, right? This is all post information. What, what do we do after the fact? All right, U.S. organizations experience thousands of cyber attacks each year at a cost of about $11.6 million. Uh, I would say that number is probably very, very low. Uh, it's hard to quantify, but uh, I'd say that number is pretty low, okay? Um, companies implementing security technologies reduce their losses by about, uh, by, by about $4 million. Defense, uh, financial services, and energy and utilities are the highest cybercrime costs. Uh, because the, 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 the value of the information or the value of the asset is much more significant, right, uh, in this particular case. 43% of costs related to data theft, 36% of the costs from lost productivity, okay? Um, now, that only accounts for 79%, but that's a big portion. 122 attacks per week with time to mitigation of about 32 days at a cost of $32,000 per day. 55% of annual cyber crime is from denial of service, web-based attacks, or inside facilitated attacks. Meaning that somebody in the organization that has escalated privileges or disgruntled employee or whatnot has provided access to it to information. All right. You're not going to have to know any of these statistics for the test. They're not going to ask you any of them, but it gives you some perspective. Intellectual property is a legal term that refers to uh, creations of mind, uh, meaning you know, uh, it could be something written, it could be something designed, it could be something built, it could be a process. Anything that's a creation of mine is considered intellectual property if it's unique. Uh, and we have intellectual property laws uh, to protect that intellectual property from being copied, used without compensation to the original creator. Uh, if comp if uh, duplicating that uh, intellectual property is actually even regulated or allowed. Uh, common types of intellectual property rights, uh, copyrights, patents, design rights, rights that protect trademarks, trade dress, and in some jurisdictions, trade secrets. Okay? Um, there is a difference uh, between, say, a trade secret and a patent. What's the biggest difference between a trade secret and a patent? 
patents are published and they're protected for a period of time, uh, meaning that after that period of time has expired, it's no longer a protected entity. Others, others can copy it, others can use it. Whereas a trade secret is never published uh, for the purposes of keeping it secret. Uh, however, it's also not protected generally under law. So if somebody identifies that trade secret, like the formula for Coke or the flavors that Kentucky Fried Chicken uses in their, their batter mix or whatever, uh, somebody can duplicate that without uh, being prosecuted. Okay. Uh, so uh, there are rights, copyright laws as well, uh, industrial design rights and so on. We'll break down some of these as we move through this lesson. In, uh, intellectual property rights are a form of property. Uh, and it could be, uh, well, generally speaking, it's intangible, right? Intellectual means created from the mind. So it's not necessarily... Uh, you know, a, a specific design for a component or a hardware or whatnot. Intellectual property is divided into two categories. Industrial property, so patents, inventions, trademarks, industrial design, geographical indications of a source, or a copyright. Copyrights are typically related to uh, artistic works, uh, books, novels, poems, plays, music, etc. Okay. All right, patents, uh, a, a set of exclusive, and, and by the way, you do need to know these definitions for the CISSP uh, because they're going to ask you on the exam in certain scenarios what applies and what doesn't apply uh, in, in specific environments, right? So there's a trademark and a copyright is different than a patent, it's different than, than a trade secret and so on. So you have to know the definition. A patent is a set of exclusive rights granted to the inventor or the assignee for a limited period of time in exchange for public disclosure of the event invention. Meaning, you're going to tell everybody how you did it, but that design and that uh, uh, process or whatever it might be is protected for a specific number of years. Meaning that you can be assured that nobody can legally duplicate your invention. Uh, now, you might think, well, why would I disclose that? Well, because if you think about it, a lot of product that gets developed and a lot of things that get designed and, and implemented can be easily copied because they're physical products. You just simply have to reverse engineer the product. Uh, so a patent allows protection against that, but only for a specific period of time. Um, and uh, patents are issued for specific technology problems, a process, a business process, a product or whatever, uh, and, and these are a form of intellectual property. Now, in order for a patent to be accepted, it has to have patentability requirements, the novelty of the item, the usefulness of the item, the non-obviousness of the item. Putting a handle on a bag uh, with two clips is not, is, not, uh, is not unique, right? That's something that everybody does. So it doesn't become, it's, it's, not, it's not a non-obvious solution to a problem, okay? But having a patent excludes others from utilizing that invention for a period of time. Well, no, that doesn't really, right? Patent infringement happens all the time. Um, and, uh, you know, some organizations, you know, I was just watching a story. Uh, and this, again, I'm not making this up. I, I literally was, uh, I saw this uh, report uh, the other day. A, a clothing company, it's amazing to me how this can even happen, but a clothing company in Los Angeles, a clothing boutique or a store, sells really high-end merchandise um, for like cut rate prices, 80% off, 90% off, whatever. We're talking about 
pairs of jeans that cost $1,500 normally and they're selling them for $500 or whatever. Um, but it's all fake. It's all fake merchandise. And the police know this. The organization knows this. Uh, they've been, they've been uh, prosecuted several times, but they still stay in business. Uh, although I do think that they finally shut them down. But, uh, and they've been fined and they've been uh, penalized, and, and, but they've never been jailed, right? So there have been civil, recor civil uh, recourse for their discretions. They've been sued by other you know, companies and whatnot for infringement on their intellectual property, but uh, they still maintain their business. So the reason why I brought that up is it says it excludes others from utilizing the invention over a period of time. Well, it doesn't. It doesn't exclude anybody from doing anything. However, it provides you protection when somebody does that. Right now, a patent is intended to exclude others, but because the invention is published, anybody can still duplicate it. Okay? This is generally very easy to do when you're dealing with organizations or companies within a specific nation, state, or region. But when you start to cross borders and boundaries for countries and continents, it becomes exceedingly difficult to enforce these, these regulations. It's amazing, right? Um, I won't say it, but the Chinese, right, uh, have a tendency to... Uh, well, duplicate a lot of intellectual property that uh, is, has been invented or uh, created in the United States. We see it all the time. And these companies operate basically above the law because it's very difficult to enforce uh, these laws across national boundaries. Um, so the uh, World Trade Organization has the... Uh, uh, trade-related aspects of intellectual property rights agreement that allows patents to be protected across uh, uh, across these boundaries, across these continents and, and countries. Uh, but again, just because a regulation exists, just because laws exist, doesn't mean that they're going to be abided by. In a lot of cases, organizations simply accept that risk, right? They duplicate, uh, they duplicate product or they steal intellectual property rights uh, and designs because the fines and the, and the, the, uh, the result of their illegal action is far outweighed by the profit and the margin and the, the sales that they make, right? Because most of this is driven based on, on sales. So yeah, okay, I'm gonna get fined a hundred thousand dollars. But I'm in the meantime I'm gonna make ten million. So yeah, of course I'm gonna do it. Right? Why wouldn't I? Um, you know, so it's uh, it's a tough thing to, to prevent. Trademarks and copyrights. A trademark is a recognizable sign, uh, design or expression which identifies products or services of a particular source from, of, 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 uh, from others. Uh, it can be an individual, a business organization, a legal entity, a name, a symbol, a color, a sound, a product shape, a device. The think tank uh, name and the think tank logo are trademarked, right? Um, now there's a couple of different types of trademark. There's uh, what we, we call a registered trademark, which means that you've gone through the process of going to the, uh, the patent and trademark office and uh, submitted a proposal to register your trademark, uh, which means that it's uh, protected for 10 years, and then you can go re-register it after that 10-year period. Or you have just simply a TM, a trademark. This is a non-registered value, meaning that you're identifying this as a trademark, but you haven't gone through the process of legally registering it as a trademark. Make sense? Um, and this is perfectly legal. If you don't want to go through the expense of actually registering uh, a, a, a logo or a symbol or a sound or whatever, you can simply tag, tag it with TM. Now what the, the, the goal of that is, is that is to protect 
um, your um, property. It's more of a uh, protection on the back end than it is on the front end. The registered trademark is a protection on the front end, uh, letting people know that, hey, this is actually a registered trademark, uh, whereas a TM insignia indicates that you claim that trademark, but you might have to uh, present legal uh, representation to, to verify that that is in fact your trademark in the event that somebody infringes on that trademark. So let's say I have a logo, right? And I've got a little TM next to my logo. Uh, didn't draw that very well. Uh, let me just draw my logo here. And here's my little TM. Um, first of all, you can't just simply trademark anything you want. And by the way, the act of trademarking is actually nothing. You're not actually doing anything to trademark something. You're simply attaching the trademark indicator to it. So if somebody else comes by and takes that logo and starts using it, I can file action against that individual, but then I have to prove to the legal entities that I've been using this logo for years, it's associated to my business. In other words, I have to prove that, uh, that I was using that information prior to this other individual. And that can be done through documentation, through a website, uh, uh, through different interactions with clients over the years and so on. So a trademark is not uh, inherently protectable uh, unless you can somehow convince the, the judge or the lawyers or whatever that, that it, it existed pri previously. There's another one you'll see, it's a SM service mark. We typically see that with logos or slogans, not logos, but slogans, you know, things that are generally temporary. Um, so you'll see an SM next to uh, a slogan. Uh, the slogan is not necessarily trademarked, it's just being used for a period of time, so it's going to have a service mark on it. Again, service mark is not something that is, is, uh, is registered. It's not something that, that you necessarily uh, have to go pay for or, or get, you know, um, you know, some legal, uh, some legal action or whatever it might be, okay? So those are the three kind of symbols that you might see, a trademark, a service mark, or a uh, registered trademark. Copyright, uh, legal rights are created, uh, created by law of uh, the country that grants the creator of the original work exclusive rights to use or distribute for a limited time. Uh, copyright is a form of intellectual property, but it's uh, a creative work. So a play, uh, a book, a poem, uh, a, 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 it could be a, a greeting card, usually something in the spoken or written written word, all right? Uh, copyrights are also, uh, well, they can be, uh, you can go through a process of copywriting information legally, or you can just assume the copyright, right? So you can uh, place the copyright symbol on your document and say, okay, this, this information is copyrighted, meaning that I'm claiming to be the owner of this information and you cannot duplicate it without my consent. Generally, uh, for written, uh, written uh, works, uh, that copyright is, is the author's life plus 50 to 100 years beyond that, at which point uh, you can then duplicate it. All right? uh, it's kind of a gray area, but uh, you get the idea. Trade secrets, uh, formulas, practices, processes, designs, instruments, patterns, commercial methods, compilation of information not generally known or reasonably ascertainable by others. Wow, okay. How about the Coke formula, right? That would be a trade secret. Trade secrets are not patents, and patents are not trade secrets because patents are published and well-known, whereas trade secrets are kept very, very secret. Business obtains uh, economic advantage over its competitors through that knowledge, uh, and this is what we call confidential information or classified information.
Okay, and then we have licensing as well. Uh, licensing is generally related to software, although copyrights can be applied to software as well. Um, it's funny that they mention this. Every two dollars of software that's purchased, there's a dollar of that that's pirated. All right. Uh, and then we have different classifications of software, freeware, shareware, commercial, and academic. Uh, all of them have acceptable use agreements that they're tied to. Uh, and, um, you know, what what is supposed to be acceptable use for that particular uh, intellectual property. Okay. Now, organizations are responsible for ensuring compliance. If, uh, if you're out of compliance, you can face generally civil action, not, not usually criminal action, unless it's, it's uh, extremely uh, malicious. If you're actually copying and duplicating and distributing software, uh, you could face criminal action. But if you're simply using software uh, outside of the bounds of whatever licensing agreement, and user licensing agreement you've established with the vendor, then you can simply be sued or fined or or uh, have to pay that vendor a specific value. All right. Import and export. Uh, the 1970s, we saw a big change. It brought all these new controls for export of products, technology, and information, the international traffic and arms regulation. Uh, that's going to control uh, the import and export of defense articles. Uh, you know, we see that with um, weapons, right? Uh, the, uh, you know, because the, the, we have this, this kind of exchange of, of uh, product, right? I mean, McDonnell Douglas and Boeing and all these manufacturers of these weapon systems and, and uh, uh, you know, military systems, uh, aren't just being sold in the United States, they're being sold to other countries as well. Uh, so this particular um, international traffic and arms regulation, ITAR, that's a United States regulatory uh, body or regime, I guess you could say, that's going to restrict and control the export of defense and military related products or technologies uh, with the sole purpose of uh, protecting or safeguarding U.S. national security interests as well as U.S. foreign policy objectives, right? Um, there are several articles related to this, like the United States Munitions List, the Arm, Arms Export Control Act, um, the uh, Directorate of Defense Trade Controls, etc., uh, Export Admissions Regula Administration Regulation. All of these... Uh, Services uh, cover those regulations um, and, are, and are part of this overall international traffic and arms regulation uh, group. Um, it, it doesn't uh, really apply policy to uh, general scientific, mathematical, or engineering principles, things that are taught in schools and colleges. Uh, and it doesn't apply to general marketing information, basic system <clears throat> system descriptions, or broad interpretations of systems. <coughs> it's more related to specifics, right? Um, and it changes over time. For example, uh, 1996 and 1997, strong cryptography um, was actually prohibited from being exported outside of the United States. Uh, and then we started to see um, space systems uh, that uh, <coughs> are incorporated in this as well. Um, in fact, there was a, uh, there was a, a case against a company uh, called Loral uh, in the mid-90s where they were trying to launch a satellite, and I guess somehow it failed. I don't, know, I don't know the specifics of it, but they were charged with violating the Arms Export Control Act as part of this ITAR um, because of uh, how they were handling the satellites and their launch vehicles uh, and how it wasn't necessarily protected. Um, so 
this is specific to U.S. manufacturers, exporters, any kind of broker of defense articles or defense services, et cetera. Um, and uh, uh, it, it involves the regulation of export to foreign military uh, individuals, a warehousing and distribution of information, and so on. All right. Um, the uh, <clears throat> there was a case where uh, Venezuela, who has has purchased many, um, I wouldn't say many, but you know, in relation to us, not that many, but several different F-16 fighter jets, and they were going to sell those aircraft to Iran. Um, because of their economic uh, struggles, and and that was uh, that was restricted by the retransfer restrictions in ITAR. Um, I don't know how they actually ensured that that was not taking place, but as far as policy goes, it was restricted under that policy. All right. You can really get bogged down uh, with these uh, these individual regulations uh, if you start to kind of get involved with a lot of these uh, these different regulations. But they don't always apply to every business or every entity, so it's not necessary that you understand all of them, right? The Export Administration's regulation. This was uh, 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 this is administered by the Department of Commerce. Uh, EAR, uh, and uh, it regulates the export of uh, dual-use items, what we call dual-use items. Uh, these are any kind of goods related to technology, uh, the data itself, technical assistance, uh, anything that's designed for commercial purpose, but could have some sort of military application, right? Computers, aircraft, pathogens uh, that are being developed for research or whatever uh, would fall under this um, this export administration regulation that's uh, managed by the Department of Commerce. There are basically three, uh, excuse me, ten different categories that fall under this. Uh, nuclear material, of course, would be one. That's very important. Anything that has to do with nuclear, right, facilities, equipment, uh, material itself, uh, microorganisms, toxins, uh, chemicals would fall under this category. Processing of materials, you know, enriching uranium, for example, or developing uh, different weapons of mass destruction. Electronics and computers would fall under here. Telecommunications and information security components would fall under here. Lasers, uh, sensors, Avionics for airplanes, navigation components for airplanes, marine components, propulsion systems, space vehicles, uh, all of this falls under that category. All right. I only listed a couple of those categories here, but, but uh, those are several others. As a security professional, you have to have a general understanding of the regulations and guidelines that are specific to your industry. So what is the that nature of the technology and how should it be classified? We're talking about the technology within your organization. Uh, what is an export or, or a deemed export, right? Um, is it excluded? Is it public domain? Uh, are there restrictions on the publications of the scientific data or the technical data related to this this technology? Are there restrictions placed on the research based on federal funding? Meaning that, okay, uh, we're now being funded by the government, which means we now fall under a different umbrella of regulation because the government likes to control what they're purchasing and uh, how that ac information is accessed. All right. So, uh, uh, and all those concepts make sense. I was going to say something else. I lost my train of thought. All those concepts make sense, but again, they don't always apply to what you're doing specifically in your environment, right? 
Um, and so you really have to, uh, and this is the challenging part for information assurance individuals uh, or security professionals is defining what category you fit into. Uh, because a lot of your directives, a lot of your policies, your risk assessments are going to be based on those categories. All right. Now, uh, the Wassenaar Agreement um, is, uh, I don't know that that's necessarily something that you're going to need to know for the exam, um, but it is uh, another regulatory um, component. It, it primarily applies to, it doesn't apply to uh, all nation states across the globe. I think uh, pretty much all of North America, uh, uh, you know, Mexico, the United States, Canada fall under this uh, uh, realm. E uh, Eastern, uh, all of Europe, Russia, India, um, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, there are uh, 42 different participating nation states um, that were part of the original Warsaw Pact countries, right? Uh, the whole point of this agreement uh, was to provide export controls uh, for conventional arms and dual-use goods, what we had talked about previously, uh, whether it's technology, property, whatever. Uh, the whole point was to establish or to contribute to some sort of regional and international security to promote transparency and responsibility in the transfer of conventional arms, dual use goods, technologies, et cetera. Um, remember, dual use goods and technologies are, are uh, anything that's kind of classified as technology that can be used for both peace for both peaceful and military functions, all right? It's basically any technology which, which satisfies more than one goal at a particular time. Um, so we, th these are technologies that can benefit uh, civilian or commercial interests, but they can also serve military purposes. Uh, uh, that's, that's what, by definition, what dual use goods are. Um, the whole point is to prevent destabilization of the globe, right? Uh, this this uh, the whole concept that we all have to work together. Um, the, parts, the, the states that are participating in this uh, agreement uh, incorporates the uh, components of the agreement in their national policies. Uh, so the whole idea is that we're ensuring that the transfer of these dual use good items don't contribute to the development or enhancement of military capabilities, which go against whatever the goal is or the objective is. Um, the, uh, I think you guys get the idea, right? Um, one of the things that's interesting about this, I was reading about this uh, a few months ago, every six months, uh, countries actually get together, they exchange information on uh, deliveries of whatever conventional arms uh, that they've supplied to these non Wassener members. Um, and uh, that would be things like tanks, armored vehicles, artillery, military aircraft, warships, helicopters, missile systems, whatever, light weapons, and so on. Um, and, uh, and so they, they have to disclose that information. A lot of these military manufacturers are still businesses, right? They're still in the business of making money, so they don't want to be restricted on who they can sell that, in, uh, that, that information for or to. As I mentioned before, dual use good te and technologies, like I said, uh, uh, electronics, computers, telecom, IS, sensors, lasers, marine, aerospace, all those, uh, there's nine different categories for these that, are, that fall under this control list. Um, and then there are some nested subsections to each of the, uh, um, to each of the categories. Let's say, for example, you have a category of na navigation and avionics, well, there might be a subsection of stealth technology um, uh, or, or 
subversive self stealth technology to detect uh, stealth uh, technology. So um, it is uh, each one. You can imagine munitions, for example, is going to have a lot of subcategories, um, and uh, you know it's it can be very very. Uh, it can be very, very detailed, all right? So uh, the United States, uh, the UK, Switzerland, Spain, Romania, New Zealand. I mean, there's, there's like I said, there are uh, 42 participating states in this, in this agreement, okay? Uh, mostly the European Union, uh, Union uh, states, um, I, I guess, uh, the ones that kind of stand out, they're not NATO members, they're not uh, part of the European Union, uh, would be like um, Russia, uh, uh, Mexico, uh, Japan, India, and so on. So, um, all right. Again, you're not going to have to know the specifics. You're not going to be required to, to, to know who's participating, etc. But you, you need to have a general understanding of what the agreement is because on the test, they might reference it and say the Wassener agreement, uh, blah, 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 and you have to understand what the, the purpose of that agreement was. All right. Trans-border data flow, very important as well, right? Cross-border commerce happens all the time today. Data gets transferred between servers and networks, particularly now that we're dealing with cloud solutions. Uh, so we have to have biometrics integrated into uh, uh, access uh, components like identity cards, passports, travel documents. Those are going to leave data trails, right? Your RFID and your passport or your driver's license or whatever. So there are some privacy concerns related to being, uh, having the ability to track and detail individual movements, all right? But the whole idea, of course, is to provide additional security um, with, uh, with the concept that uh, more information is good, uh, and, and it falls under that realm of, well, if you're not doing anything wrong, you shouldn't really care about whether or not somebody is tracking your, your movements. But, you know, that's a slippery slope, right? Uh, organizations automate and outsource processing personal information of customers. And citizens, of course, relying on third parties to uh, process that information obviously brings up additional security concerns because now you're, you're transferring risk of that information to another entity. Uh, RFIDs, unified communications, web logging, geo-tracking, all of this technology leaves data trails. All right. Uh, government agencies monitoring individuals more closely blurs the boundaries of information rights. This is what I was talking about with regard to patent infringement and intellectual property rights infringement. It becomes extremely difficult with this global economy and the ability to move from nation state to nation state. Uh, it becomes exceedingly difficult to protect individual rights because every country Every nation state has their own method for protecting those rights. So uh, it, uh, it, that, that is definitely a challenge. All right. Personally identifiable information, often stored online, increases the focus on collection, use, retention, and destruction of that information. Very, very important, right? And a lot of regulations and a lot of uh, 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 standards are used today to, to, to incorporate that. Regulations and laws can be wide sweeping or generic, which is a horizontal enactment. Think of you know, looking across the horizon. Uh, that's a very wide uh, view, uh, very uh, geographically dispersed view or industry-based. Verticals, right? And we talked about this in the previous lesson. In healthcare, we've got HIPAA compliance. In the financial sector or the business sector, we have Sorbanes-Oxley. In the in the uh, uh, you know, financial industry, we have a PCI DSS compliance and so on. Um, as a training company and as an IT consulting company, I don't care about HIPAA compliance because I'm not 
handling medical records or personal information in that regard. We must protect information and balance businesses, government, and academic or research needs to collect that information. Everything today works based on having information. So there is a need to collect information. It makes it convenient uh, for things to occur. It, it gives us the ability to provide enhanced services to customers and clients. Uh, but at the same time, now that you're the custodian of that information, you have a certain responsibility of protecting that information. So it's, it's, it's not as simple to say, it's not simple to say, let's just go ahead and, and uh, let's just go ahead and not collect the information because that's not conducive to what we're trying to accomplish to make our lives easier or better. Um, but you have to balance the need to collect that information with uh, how you protect that information. You have to understand the basic privacy principles and guidelines and privacy regulations. We've seen that bullet point a few times. As a security information officer, you need to understand the regulations and privacy principles that apply to you as a business. Privacy is defined as the rights and obligations of individuals and organizations to have the ability to collect, use, retain, and disclose personal information. Very important. Okay. We're just about done wrapping up this chapter, uh, but let's go ahead and finish up. Uh, organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, uh, just another kind of uh, governing body, although this is uh, uh, kind of like the IT governance body where we're just simply offering recommendations, uh, states this, limit the collection of personal data lawfully with consent of the subject. Check, that makes sense. Uh, data relevant to uh, the purpose for which it's supposed to be used should be accurate and up-to-date. In other words, if you're collecting data for uh, voting purposes or you're collecting data for, for to report on credit for an individual, you can't simply report whatever information you want. It has to be accurate, it has to be verifiable, and it has to be complete. Okay. The purpose of the data collection should be defined and use limited to that purpose. You have to have a specific reason for collecting information and you have to be able to demonstrate that the information that's being collected is only used for that particular reason. Personally identifiable information is never disclosed unless permitted or required by law. Uh, data protected by security safeguards against loss, unauthorized access, destruction, use, modification, and disclosure, meaning that you have to use due diligence to protect the information and the individuals responsible for that information have to use due care. The data owner needs to be able to have quick access to that collected data, the ability to change the data contents as needed, have data erased, rectified, or uh, amended. Or, or completed if it's inaccurate or incomplete. Uh, ultimately, the data owner is the one that's responsible uh, for the data itself. You can still have a custodian of the information, you can still have a user of the information, but the owner is the one that actually owns the information. All right, in the realm of data breaches, there are some terms that you're gonna have to know, an incident, is defined as a security event that compromises the integrity, the confidentiality, or the availability of information. A breach means that information has been disclosed or there's a potential exposure of information. So somebody was able to gain access to a system, maybe they didn't actually copy all of the data, but there was still the potential for exposure of that data, so the integrity of that data is now compromised. Uh, data disclosure, the breach confirmed that data was actually disclosed to an unauthorized party. So a breach doesn't necessarily result in data disclosure. Uh, but, uh, but it, it, and a breach is an incident, by the way, so all these are related to each other. As a security professional, you need to understand the kinds of breaches uh, and uh, data, data disclosures, that should say data, um, uh, and you need to identify and respond to those breaches quickly, as quickly as possible. 
All right. Uh, some categories, uh, point of sale intrusions, 14%. Uh, um, these are based on 94% of all the breaches that occurred. This is from 2014, so it's a little bit old, but uh, point of sale in, uh, interactions, 14%. Web application attacks, 35%. Insider misuse, 8%. Physical theft, less than 1%. Miscellaneous errors. Uh, I'm not sure what tech qualifies, maybe bad code or whatever. Uh, crimeware, card skimmers, uh, and cyber es espionage. So you can see that uh, web application attacks is the biggest category. And that makes sense, right? Because uh, that's data that's exposed to the public and uh, very usually generally easy to get access to, okay? So we'll wrap up this lesson uh, by just kind of uh, 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 highlighting again the, the relevant laws and regulations. Uh, the federal regulations reference uh, Graham Leach Bailey Act, uh, GLBA, and the HIPAA uh, Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. Financial sector applies to GLBA, healthcare applies to HIPAA. We've already talked about both of those in, in a little bit of detail. Uh, and then you have various state level laws and regulations which might apply even city laws uh, potentially or county laws. Uh, so again, you have to be aware of those, right? And so you have to be aware of those in relation to the industry that you're involved in as well. Very, very important. All right, so we'll wrap up this lesson. We're going to move on and in, uh, into our next lesson.